Uh, I'm Mike Mattacino, and uh, I've had the privilege of helping celebrate the 40th anniversary of Close Encounters of the Third Kind this year. I'm currently putting the finishing touches on a brand new restored soundtrack release that's coming out soon. And first, let's bring out um, the author of a brand new fantastic book called Close Encounters of the Third Kind, The Ultimate Visual History, Mr. Michael Clasterin. <laughs> And we uh, have a gentleman who has the uh, talent of making things look 25 times larger than they really are, an enviable talent. Uh, one of the great miniature effects artists ever, Mr. Greg Jean. And uh, to my left here is a nine-time Academy Award winner and a guy who you, whose name you could also step on on Hollywood Boulevard, Mr. Dennis Murin. <laughs> and the director of the uh, visual effects photography for Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and we'll talk about his many other things, the wonderful, amazing Douglas Trumbull. <laughs> So this is certainly going to be a close encounter for all of us because just think about this for a moment that in this room right now is represented 2001 A Space Odyssey, Star Wars, Close Encounters of course, Blade Runner, E.T., Jurassic Park, Star Trek motion picture, all in this room probably the greatest visual effects movies of all time are represented so this is indeed an honor gentlemen. So, it, in a way, this all started with 2001 A Space Odyssey with Doug, directed, of course, by Stanley Kubrick, 1968. And I have to just share um, from a 70 millimeter screening at the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood from a uh, few years back. Is my friend Neil here? Is Neil, I'm trying to remember when this was. Was anybody at this uh, legendary screening of 2001, I think it was maybe 2008 or nine, where an honest to goodness acid trip took place that caused them to stop the film after the Stargate sequence. So uh, I'm sitting in the first row of the balcony and suddenly this guy starts screaming and yelling, Stanley Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick, and they, uh, I think, ended up, somebody had to punch him, and then they dragged him out, they stopped the film, the cops came, he was tasered, so it's like, I think we had, just as recently as that, a legitimate 1968 <laughs> experience of 2001, uh, and you've probably caused um, quite a few of those over the, the The rumor, the urban legend was that Kubrick planned the intermission so that if you dropped acid at the intermission, the effect would kick in at the start of the Stargate sequence. But um, not true. Not true. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so many films were influenced by 2001, not least, is, least of which is Star Wars and Close Encounters, both of which came out in 1977. Yet the two movies can, are completely, completely opposite. Uh, was anyone, anyone around at the time that saw them in 77 or 78? So do you all remember that when Close Encounters came out, we'd already seen Star Wars and everybody was talking, it seemed, about how does it compare? And not only the visual effects, but in every other way, uh, they were completely opposite and almost the comparisons were invalid. But um, the, in, one of the things that was unique about both of them is that there was nothing those are two movies, new, two movies where you had nothing to look back on and say, well, this movie did that and we're kind of following that. These were both inventing things that we really had never seen before. Um, and you know, the pathway to that, um, Doug, you were at the center of because you had put together a team of people to work with Robert Wise on The Andromeda Strain. And in the same year that that came out in 1971, um, you directed your first movie, Silent Running, and that team basically became the core of the, the group that did the original Star Wars. Can, could you be, maybe give us some of that background, how all this came to be? 
Well, uh, when I was making uh, Silent Running, which, which was a very low budget movie, and the reason this movie got a green light was that um, Easy Rider had come out of the blue. The Hollywood did not understand the idea of a low budget independent movie. And uh, so Easy Rider made like $65 million on a $250,000 budget or some crazy thing. And, and the management of Universal Studios just didn't understand what it was or how it would happen. And so they decided to do kind of a social experiment of funding five $1 million movies and finding independently minded filmmakers that were not in the mainstream and allow them to make these movies. And, and Silent Running was one of those picked with, uh, you know, er, first time or early directors, weird subject matter. Um, and so Silent Running got a, a green light to get made. And uh, we had almost no money. So I, I actually went to a big union meeting. I said, I, I want to use students to help make this movie. And I, I had met some young people that I really liked, Wayne Smith, became one of our production designers, um, John Dykstra, and many other people from Long Beach State College Industrial Design Department. And so the union, I, I kind of threatened them because I had just made a trip to Japan for a completely other reason, to see an expo project. And um, I said, if you, don't, if you don't agree to let us mix the crew, we're going to go make the movie in Japan. That was a total lie, but <laughs> they, they went for it. So they allowed us to have just a very limited union crew, which was a very good crew, of, you know, really seasoned Hollywood professionals, as well as our young guys, John Dykstra, Wayne Smith, and, and a bunch of other people that worked with us on the movie to make this movie at a low budget. And then after Silent Running was finished, I was very proud that I'm, I'm a first time director and I want to direct more movies. And I was developing all kinds of screenplays at many studios. I had deals at Fox and Warner Brothers and MGM and, and my, my, my uh, career was kind of percolating really fast. And George Lucas came and asked if I would do the vis visual effects for Star Wars. And I said, well, no, but I'd like to, I'll help you find the right guys. And what happened at the time was that I was in what now is called development hell which is none of these movies were going ahead that these studios for all kinds of completely wacky reasons. And so my career as a director was getting thwarted and I wasn't moving ahead and I had no work. And when George said, well, could you help me? I said, well, why don't you take this crew of guys that we, that we just did silent running, including my own father, Don Trumbull, and John Dykstra and a lot of the model builders. And so he actually hired them to become phase one of what was Industrial Light and Magic out at the uh, Van Nuys Airport. So they set up ILM there and did the effects for Star Wars. And then a little bit later, when I'm still in development hell, um, Spielberg asked me to, to work on Close Encounters. And I said, yeah, I, I think I have to do this. And I had my own ulterior motive, which was to get my hands on 65 millimeter cameras uh, for the show scan process that I was developing at the time. So it kind of worked for me, and it worked for Richard Yurisich. And so we put together a whole other team, but we were all very friendly with ILM and all the guys there. And so we were both, both of these productions of Star Wars and Close Encounters were going on fairly simultaneously. Um, and that's kind of how that all happened. I hope that explains it. Yes, thanks. Um, Michael, so you have done this amazing book now chronicling the production of Close Encounters and all of the amazing work that happened in it. Uh, we've read a lot about it before, but could you encapsulate for us how that came to be for Steven Spielberg and um, you know, you know, the process uh, through which he was able to actually start getting this movie made? Sure. Um, Steven had wanted to make this film starting from when he was a child. Um, he tells the story of as a, as a six-year-old boy being woken up in the middle of the night by his father who said, come with me. He drove him out to uh, the middle of a field in New Jersey and he laid down a blanket and they laid down and looked up and there was a meteor shower going on. And, and Stephen credits that moment as the first time he acknowledged the existence of the universe. And, and he became very, very uh, fascinated with astronomy. Um, years later, he had always had 
an idea in his mind, and he started to think about it seriously when he was directing Sugarland Express. So he, at the same time in post-production, when he was on the Universal lot doing that, he made the acquaintance of Michael Phillips, who was there doing post-production on The Sting with his then wife, Julia Phillips. And, and Stephen and Michael struck up a friendship, and Stephen decided to pitch a story to Michael, who said, yes, I'm in. Uh, at the time, it was also a time of around Watergate. And Stephen's original thought for the story was that this was going to be the alien encounter, but about the government cover-up trying to keep people from knowing it. The main character was not Roy Neary. He was an Air Force officer who worked for an organization called Project Sign. This was an actual organization. Their, their public face was to investigate sightings of UFO. Behind the scenes, their mission was to debunk them. And, and the main character was one of those debunkers until he has his own experience, his own encounter. And then he's the one who starts digging behind the scenes to find out what the truth is. And it led to the, uh, the encounters between the two species. Um, over the course of time, the, the one funny story that Stephen told me was while he was directing Jaws, he had a visitor to the set, um, was an NBC news anchor, a very respected news anchor named John Chancellor, who also had a vacation home on Martha's Vineyard. And Stephen was very excited to tell him about his idea. It's Watergate, it's the government cover-up. They, they don't want people to know. And, and Chancellor said to him, well, here's the problem with that. Don't you think if there was alien life on Earth that we could prove that President Nixon wouldn't have given that up in a second to the media to divert away from the Watergate conspiracy and all his crimes. And, you know, Stephen said, that threw the biggest wet blanket on a movie that I hadn't directed yet. But happily, he got a towel, dried himself off, and, you know, then, you know, it became the story of the common man in an uncommon, extraordinary series of events. So that's, that's the basic beginnings of it. Well, you've uh, touched on a number of points that I'd like to come back to, which actually relate to specifically the um, visual effects. But we should also mention the movie Firelight, which was a feature-length movie that he directed in the 60s. It's before he moved from Arizona. He was 16 years old. That was his first full-length feature, and it was about the lights in the skies and the mysterious disappearances of, of people and animals in this small little town. Um, he made it for a budget of $500. He rented out a theater for one night. It made $600, so he was into profit on his first movie. <laughs> When we see clips of that which exist, and, I suppose, and I'm told that there's still one reel missing, um, but they managed to piece it together, you see his approach, even though accomplished very crudely, to these colorful lights in the sky that were even different from every flying saucer picture that had been done in the 50s and 60s. You know, um, He had a, a unique idea in mind of what things in the sky should look like. So uh, that, that, you know, it's interesting to just contemplate where did something like that come from, do you think? Was it just really, does it all go back to that meteor shower? It does. It does. I mean, Stephen was very, very clear on that, that the stories that started to come into his mind. And he was also a very big science fiction fan. Um, and, and one of those movies that he quoted as, as one, or cited as one of his favorites was The Day the Earth Stood Still. Um, but the difference was that in Stephen's mind, he didn't believe that uh, an alien civilization would come all this way to destroy. Um, all of the movies 
in, in the, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, when, when it involved aliens, they were conquerors, marauders, invaders. They were all here to either kill us or enslave us. And none of them had any benign creatures that wanted to have an exchange with us on, on an intellectual level. Uh, and, and, you know, there was, if I remember correctly, um, the possibility that Mr. Kubrick had wanted to present aliens in 2001, but um, wasn't able to or decided not to, you know, whatever was the case. So, so this was truly the first story that told, you know, uh, of this momentous occasion, and it told it in a very believable uh, and honest way. Well, you you all know about the J. Allen Hynek connection. He was who was the um, the advisor on Close Encounters and yeah. Him. yeah. And there's uh, I'll I'll just try to I'll tell you some bits and pieces of what I have heard. I don't know if any of these stories are true. I have no way to verify any of this. But the J. Allen Hynek, who was this UFO researcher who was really hired by the government to debunk UFOs was getting such inf interesting and provocative information from their files or from the experiences of reports that he turned and decided that he thought the whole phenomena was absolutely quite real and quite deeply important. And um, so he had some influence on Stephen, had written books about the subject matter and everything. And that's where the title of Close Encounters comes from, is from J. Allen Hynek. Right, he coined the the, Absolutely. The, the terminology of those three different types of encounters. And, and in and fact, I think the script that was the one that Paul Schrader was asked to write was kind of a fictionalized version of Hynek, right? About this guy that had a government job and then had an experience and it changed his... The, the version that Mr. Schrader turned in was, you know, so far in the opposite direction of what Stephen had had in mind. Um, but, but Doug is, is correct um, in that Dr. Hynek was originally a debunker um, with Project Sign. And he, in, in all of the cases that he looked at, he said, yes, a lot of them were false, obviously, or they could be disproved. But there was a certain percentage that there was no explanation for that he they looked in every corner, every way. They looked at it, examined it, and they could not explain it. And that was the beginning of him becoming a believer. And and Stephen did, in fact, you know, read everything that Dr. Hynek wrote. And when he changed the title to Close Encounters, he then got a letter from Dr. Hynek because that was proprietary material. And and Stephen was unaware of that. He just he thought that was an already established title or, or categories um, and that's when they met and became involved on a personal level and Dr. Hynek was invited to be a technical advisor on the film. Which because originally I think the working title was Watch the Skies, Watch the Skies. which is the famous yes. last line of uh, is it the thing from another world right so from so the old the homage there. There, there were two titles uh, prior it was Watch the Skies and A Meeting of the Minds was uh, another title that was thought of early on. Well, are, you, are you aware of the, the uh, Jacques Vallée connection? Uh, I am. I believe you, you told me about him. Well, there's another connection that, that only occurred to me much later because I wasn't aware of the resources that Stephen was using in drafting the screenplay. I was led to believe that he'd written it himself. And uh, so one of the key characters is played by uh, Francois Truffaut, who plays Lacombe, who is the French UFO researcher that's come to the United States to be part of this event. And uh, I never thought much about it at the time until many, many years later, I was working with uh, J. Allen Hynek's son, Joel Hynek, who is a visual effects guy. And we were working on a project at my studio in Massachusetts and uh, Joel said, well, you know, you really, I'd like to tell you a little bit of the history of my father because there's another connection that you should be aware of, which is Jacques Vallée. I said, okay, who's he? He says, well, he's the real Lacombe. 
and that Jacques Vallée had been researching the whole UFO phenomena all of his life, that Jacques Vallée had seen a UFO in his backyard in a suburb of Paris when he was 11 years old. It was corroborated by a next door neighbor, kid friend of his, and it just utterly changed his life because it was so undeniably real that Jacques Vallée became obsessed with UFOs and trying to figure out what this whole thing was. And so he was writing books about UFO stories that were being reported by people of being abducted or encountering a mothership or various kinds of craft and beings and greys and everything. And um, had written many books about it. And so the link was Jacques Vallée, and I asked Joel, so well, can you tell me how to get in touch with Jacques Vallée? I want to meet him. So I did. I made it my job to meet Jacques Vallée in San Francisco. He's a Silicon Valley venture capital high-tech guy, but his avocation is UFO research. And Jacques said, well, I had written all the books that Steven Spielberg was reading before he wrote the screenplay. I said, oh, that's really interesting, because that puts a whole new twist on Close Encounters. Because I said, well, is, I mean, did, was there a big meeting? Was there a mothership? Was there an exchange of personnel? Are all these real stories? And he says, well, hmm, could be. <laughs> you know, so that was when the whole thing switched in my mind that Close Encounters is not entirely fictional. It's a fictionalized depiction of hy hypothetically real stories that well, Jacques Vallée could tell you the basis of. And so Jacques has been a good friend of mine, and I'm, I'm, I continue to be really involved peripherally in trying to do some UFO research myself that I think is really, it's more interesting than science fiction, because it's science fact. And uh, I intend to get there. <laughs> On the mothership? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes. All right. But I don't intend to leave. Okay. <laughs> well, when it comes to, um, the task of actually putting these things on film. Um, there's a lot, of course, Michael's book goes into a lot of it. A lot of it has been covered over the decades in different publications. And, uh, uh -huh, out of it. the movie. Yes, yeah, so your cameo, right? The cuboid scene. <laughs> um, but uh, it, what we maybe don't get a lot of that I'd like to hear from you guys is you know, as I said, you had nothing to look back on is that this has been done before, so we're kind of following the footsteps of something with either Close Encounters or Star Wars. <coughs> now, your place was set up, is it Marina Del Rey is where you've worked? Yes. Okay, and then uh, ILM was here in, in the Valley in Van Nuys. But um, at the time, to have latest technology in an average home probably meant that you had push-button telephone, maybe a color television. Um, but you guys were suddenly coming into this and having to use the technology to create these amazing movies that we just now take for granted and we're now in a place where everybody's kind of got special effects on their laptop and can just do things, you know, just by almost thinking about them. But the technical things aside, what was the group of people like? And Dennis, what was it like to come into ILM in 1976? What was that, you know, who were these guys? What were their backgrounds? What was it just like to be among them? I have no idea. I'd seen uh, 2001 when it came out, and I actually come from what I always called the King Kong school of, in L.A. of guys that grew up on Kong and stop motion and miniatures and the light eckers and all. I knew nothing about the technology at all. And uh, at Cascade where we worked, um, you know, we couldn't even buy another camera. We couldn't even buy a motor. Money wouldn't be there. So you just use the same tools over and over again. So you see 2001 and it's like, what the heck am I looking at? I had no idea. And some friends of mine uh, said, well, I think there's some motors going on here. And I didn't, you know, slits, something. I just didn't comprehend it. But I got real curious about it. And when I heard that George was doing this, you know, Star Wars, and I liked his film so much, and it was being done, in the valley, I said, you know, here's a chance. I didn't know anybody on it except I met John. And just once or so, and I said, I want to try to get on this film. So I walked into not knowing anybody or not knowing anything about the tool set. But what John saw in me was someone who understood slow photography, stop motion photography, whatever, like that trick, you know, running film backwards, all the old traditional techniques, and he thought that I could learn quickly the motion control stuff and actually visualize in advance what we have in mind. And he was right. That was really easy to me. And it was, but it was hard to learn how to use the equipment. But it was fascinating. And, and all the time I'm thinking, you know, we, there's other ways to do this. We could do this faster. 
you know, sliding it down on wires and stuff that Greg Jean and I had done in other shows, uh, the old-fashioned way. And uh, but it was taking forever. And, oh God! And uh, but you get it all done, and to me, it looks pretty much totally fake with the funny moves the ship's making. But that is a magic that people see in it that they don't understand. And once we learned how to do it, which I think came sort of later, at least in, at ILM, than the next shows, we got everything looking much smoother and more fluid in it and had more of a sense of reality. So I totally bought into it. I went by saying, you know, you know, it's taking so long and how, poor George is going to lose all his money. Uh, but we did get it done, like all these shows somehow get done in the last month, which is phenomenal how that happens, or two months. Um, to being a total advocate of that and understanding technology to, you know, as a real tool to express what's in your head. Well, let's just, but take me about, uh, tell me about the people. It's like if we could just go back in time right now to that place in Van Nuys in 1976, who were what would we see? Who would we meet? Well, you'd see, like Doug said, you'd see a lot of guys from Long Beach State uh, who were in the industrial design department from George on down. Grant McCune, I think, was there. A lot of the model makers were there. Uh, Joe Johnston had been there. And they really hadn't worked on very many films. Maybe some had worked on Silent Running and, you know, maybe, and others had never been in a film or anything before. Uh, a couple of them had, so there was something there, but it was totally, you know, no experience in it, but there was this motivation to get this thing done and to lay it out like a, as a project with different departments doing it, and it's gonna go from this to that, to that, to that, and we have to staff up each department, and, and instead of, you know, everything being made the way Greg would make it, one at a time detailed models, there were molds being made, and you'd crank out 12, you know, X-wings out of this one mold, and it's like, what the heck is this? So it was a completely different way of, of working, and of course they did the precision stuff when they needed to on it, but they also had a, a whole other way of working that, that I hadn't seen anything like that was like a mass production, and I think that mindset went through the whole place that realizing, of course, they got to do two or three or four hundred shots, and they got to get them done, so it does take a different type of thinking, and more of a, and I've, I've thought just recently, I'm sure this all comes from the spirit of the 60s, and I don't want the thing saying that about, oh, you know, what, I don't know what you mean by that, whatever, but we were incredibly optimistic in the 60s, and threw away what, we, what we'd known before, thinking that we've seen it, it's kind of obsolete, we need some new thinking here, there's got to be a different way to solve something, a different way to see something, and I think that spirit was in like all these shows on Close Encounters too, I'm guessing, and on the Star Wars group to, that, that gave that energy and took those chances to do something. Because you've got an optimism all along you're gonna succeed. Did you feel that way, Doug, with yours and Richard's group as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I agree completely with what Dennis is saying, that, we, that there was a weird kind of, we could do anything kind of feeling. And we were at a time when all kinds of new technologies were emerging almost every day. And just like one of the biggest breakthroughs that uh, I was so excited about was pulse motors, digital stepper motors that could do controlled motion at any speed you wanted. And I started pioneering that at my company even before we did close, before I did silent running. And I found out about these stepper motors from my father-in-law. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, it's a motor that you can control digitally with a signal. And I, I, I went down to some place downtown LA and bought a motor and bought a driver and a car battery and some resistors. And, and then uh, my guy I was working with at the time, uh, Jamie Short, whose brother Bill Short did the shark for Jaws, um, he was a young kind of electronics wizard, really very talented guy. And we figured out how to record square wave sound pulses on a four track tape recorder and play these pulses into these motors so that we could control the motor and actually play the tape again and repeat the move again and again. And that was the beginning of motion control that would be digitally controllable and variable speed, which we couldn't do on, on 2001. Everything in 2001 is all moving in one direction at one speed because we had no digital control over ramping up speeds or changing speeds during a shot. So that came to bear on Star Wars and Close Encounters simultaneously. We had two completely separate teams of wizard electronics engineers building the first really workable motion control systems, one for Close Encounters and one for Star Wars. Well, um, just a week ago or so, we had John Batham here talking about Dracula 
afterwards I talked with him about his movie War Games from 1983, and I said, do you know? I said, I think it's, it's fun. We had movies where computers ran amok, like Colossus or right. Demon Seed, but they were usually government operations in big rooms and big, huge computers. And I said, I really think War Games is the first time we saw a computer in somebody's bedroom in an average home, and it was part of the plot. Because even the year before, when we had E.T. and Poltergeist, there were no computers in those families' homes. So, and as I said, it's like technology for average people in the years that you guys were making those two movies just wasn't in the house yet. So I imagine that just the, one of the main breakthroughs uh, of actually getting a computer to be able to repeat a camera movement precisely was just a huge, huge breakthrough in terms of what you could actually do. But the thing is about, to go back to 2001 and the original Star Wars, Neither of those films, I believe, had too many shots where you had to worry about atmospheric depth. It was in most of an outer space. There was a few planet things in Star Wars. But Close Encounters is the opposite because yeah. it's now all set you know, in real, real environments and is, therefore it's inf affected by its, its environments. That's going to affect what you do with the lighting and so forth. So right. again, um, you know, tell me about you know, some of this technology and, and what it was like to experience these breakthroughs and maybe if you could talk about those two approaches of putting a spaceship against a star field in space versus having it to go out to a normal suburban environment and actually believe that something is in the sky. Because again, I don't think nobody had ever really attempted that. Nobody, we hadn't seen a night sky like Close Encounters prior to that. We hadn't seen um, UFOs other than flying saucers kind of <laughs> plastered on a screen. This was just, you know, we just hadn't seen anything like this, and you guys invented it. Well, 2001 had a lot of space in it, <laughs> and uh, and most of it was hard-edged objects, you know, the S Discovery spacecraft or the pod or whatever against a star field. Very, very simple stuff. And so we were dealing with this kind of uh, white-painted miniatures superimposed against a star field, which was an animated, really. And uh, that was pretty straightforward, looking back. We had to figure it out at the time. And when George decided to do Star Wars, it was similar in the fact that you see a lot of white-painted spacecraft against a black star field. And the advent of motion control meant that the, the spacecraft could move dynamically, and the camera could move dynamic. There's a lot more motion potential made. Close Encounters intrigued me a lot because of the kind of things that Stephen was asking for, which was this diaphanous, beautiful, mysterious, almost ghost-like imagery of, of glaring lights in your face. And you couldn't define the shape of the UFO. You could hardly see what the heck it was. Stephen said, well, I want it to look like a, a 747 approaching the runway at LAX at night. And you can't see the fuselage of the plane. You just see these lights, but they're in a pattern, and they look like an object, and it's obviously not natural. And that's what led to this, the cloud tank and the smoke room and all the ways of creating these atmospheric effects. And then kind of we were going through a developmental phase and an understanding of lens flares. How do you make lens flares? How much overexposure do you need in order to get the lens to flare? And how to create beams of light and then the creating an atmosphere on our stage, which was a miniature atmosphere of smoke, which just looks like air, only condensed to the miniature size of the miniatures. And um, Dennis had one of the, I think one of the best jobs on the whole show, which was shooting the mothership, which was based entirely on that idea taken to an extreme. And, and uh, Greg built this miniature, and it was all based on this idea of a dense smoke atmosphere to create scale. So you're basically taking the atmosphere, like an L.A. atmosphere, you say, well, you're here in Burbank, and if you're looking at the mountains five miles away, there's kind of an what we call aerial, aerial perspective of the atmosphere that creates a scale. Well, I know that. It looks like it's about five miles away. Well, you're taking that entire atmosphere and condensing it to eight feet instead of eight miles. And then you have to make the atmosphere denser, which was how we do with smoke. And then the whole idea of, the, of what Greg was building for the mothership was based on tests that we did to show that if you put these lights, these lit objects, the mothership was lit up by itself. It was an illuminated 
object from inside. There's no key light or fill light on the mothership. And um, except there was, but um, primarily it lit itself up, and it was the smoke that made it look so spectacularly huge, like a whole city when it was only, what, six feet in diameter? You're going to talk about the mothership yeah, before we're, we're finished here, Greg. Yeah, we, I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. <laughs> But uh, you know, the other thing that occurred to me is that uh, just conceptually of doing effects, one of the things about Star Wars that I guess you guys, it took a while to really wrap your mind around what George was envisioning, had a lot to do with not so much accomplishing the effects, but with this fast editing pace that he wanted. Um, which basically you know, translates to that the effect has to just kind of work and if you cut them together, you get an impression of images where you now are understanding a story and it's told with, with visuals. Doug, I know you like to have a shot that's so good and so believable that if you could hold a 30, 40 seconds and, you're, and, and the believability never collapses. Um, so um, you, you, can you talk about that whole idea and what, you know, how did George communicate what he was trying to accomplish and how did Steven communicate what he was trying to accomplish Again, two very different styles based on stuff that we had never ever seen. You know, how, how did these guys you know, have this in their head and what were they saying to you? Well, George just kept saying faster and faster. And he talked in terms of frames. You know, this only has to be 32 frames long. Because he had this footage that he'd gotten from old movies he shot off TV of real, real uh, war scenes of airplanes flying and, and movies and all and cut the, these sequences together, these dogfight sequences and everything. Uh, and so in doing that, he could see I can keep the energy going by having this part be 32 frames long, and then the next one be 20 frames long, and the next one is like 65 or 90 frames long. He got the feeling from that of an editor how the audience was going to feel the energy, and and you know we never thought of that for a minute because normally effects people shoot the shot, they have a beginning and end, and you base it on your budget, and you give them whatever you can, and they do whatever they can, but then that's it. But he really stuck to it, and it took a while to learn that and to try and realize to get the energy into these few frames is not easy. Because in a live action shoot, you know, say you're doing a race movie or cars or something, you shoot tons of footage and they'll find those 32 frames. But when you've got to come up with 32 frames of an X-wing doing something and maneuvering out of the Death Star or something, a lot has to be communicated in that when you've in fact shot nothing. So that took a lot of time to make the shots look like documentary, like they needed to look. The lighting had to be make the objects readable. The foreground and background and any other ships had to match and the camera moves, there had to be dynamics. And yet you had to think in this little tiny time stretch. And then we had the deadline on top of that. So it, it was, uh, and for me, and I'll let Doug finish this up, going from that into being able to sit there and linger at pictorial beauty going by was just mind boggling for me. And it was just like going you know, to two photo schools, you know, one right after another. You know, I mean, one's film school, but the other is just much, is just a completely different type of photography. And was beautiful and just, and so, completely different, like you said. And I learned completely different things on both shows. So for you, there was, it was a hard, Star Wars was done, and then Close Encounters was no overlap? Yeah, I had four days off between the two. And that was it. I, mean, I knew that Star Wars was coming to an end, and I had a chance to get on Close Encounters and jumped on that. To, uh, to work with Doug, but also to meet Steven. I took both shows. I was ready to get out of the business because there was no business. But I took both shows at the beginning to meet the directors and to get to meet George and then to get to meet Steven. And then I figured that's the end of it. There won't be any more films like this and I'll go into something else. Well, I mean, it's, and George had done American Graffiti with not a single effect shot in it. You know, who yes, cares? Yes, he great did film. THX. Yeah, it's a great film. <laughs> Stephen had done Jaws, which I think had some rotoscoped water and a couple of meteors. But otherwise, everything in it's in front of a camera. <coughs> Every moment with a shark is either the mechanical shark or real shark photography. And then he does this, has this vision of this thing, you know, that um, we, we really, if you had just seen Duel and the Sugarland Express and Jaws, you didn't necessarily see Close Encounters coming from Stephen, yet he had this in his head and then had to try to communicate what he wanted and how, um, how this needed to look. And uh, yes, you could have sketches and whatever, but then you have to figure out how to do it. So again, this idea of the, uh, the realism of it, 
where I just don't remember any movie prior to that that actually looked like places where we actually were at night. But objects in the sky, we really believed that they were there. There was, um, uh, you know, they were just embedded into it, did not look matted on, did not look plastered on. Um, and I guess that has a lot to do with your um, focus on always using 70 millimeter so that when you finish with all the optical stuff and it goes back down to 35 millimeter, it doesn't announce itself as a visual effect shot. Um, so tell me about just how that all just came out and your thought about how, well, how do you make that work? I think there, and there's kind of a continuity. If you're actually in the business, like Dennis was trying to get out of it at the time, but whatever, if, you're, if you have a continuity of job after job, because my, my work before 2001 was a movie called To the Moon and Beyond for the New York World's Fair, shot in 70 millimeter. Kubrick and Clark saw that, and it kind of validated their idea. Oh, you can put some stars and some black sky on a dome screen in a planetarium, and it'll look okay. It was 10 per of 70 millimeter, but that was what validated Stanley Kubrick and Arthur Clark that you could actually do this and get it on a screen. And so then they decided, yes, we, we can make 2001. So 2001 had Kubrick's version of these long, ling lingering, uninterrupted shots, because his objective was to make the audience feel like they're in space. He, he decided to abandon conventional, melodramatic editorial style and have these just epic shots that just stayed on the screen for a long, long period of time while music plays. Just a view, it was a visual trip, and it became called the ultimate trip. And so Kubrick was very into these uninterrupted spectacles, and he kind of felt an, an obligation to do this spectacle because he was following on to... Uh, the Wonderful World of the Brothers Grimm, or uh, How the West Was Won, you know, these epic uh, three strip and then ultimately 70 millimeter Lawrence of Arabia type movies. And when you have this giant 100 foot wide screen, you have a kind of responsibility to put something good up there instead of cutting really fast. And so I think there's also a linkage between the giant screen and a conventional screen in terms of your editorial pace. When you get into that territory of IMAX type movies, you cut much more slowly. You don't make action movies because 24 frames doesn't even hold up on a giant screen. That's a problem. Right. You get blurring. I'm, I'm yakking about blurring all the time. Um, but for Close Encounters, one, one of the things that really intrigued me and my partner Richard Yurcich was the fact that Star Wars was going to be these hard-edged objects of spacecraft against black s skies with stars. And you could use a, what's called a you know, traditional traveling mat. You could use blue screen, or you could use a cutout, or you could use a high contrast mat, or any number of the ways that, that, that Dennis could tell you about it better than I could. And Close Encounters needed all these soft-edged, non-cutout things of, of lens flares that actually scattered all the way across the frame. And Richard Yurisic started working up really clever ways to use optical printing and not use hard-edged mats we would actually use the lens flare itself that had been photographed on the original negative and use that as a mask in the composite so that it wasn't a hard edged mat it was a it was a mat of it it was a mask of itself that had this kind of continuing diaphanous quality to it and it was a whole technique that he had worked out with the guys on the optical printer to create composites that still retain softness and that blurry, mysterious, almost spiritual kind of looking at ghosts in the sky kind of thing rather than objects. I had to just chime in about lens flares because in sort of what they teach you in photography is that you position your camera to avoid lens flares. But the thing is that when you're doing effects, what happens is this sense that, well, if I'm seeing a lens flare, then obviously there's really somebody there with a camera shooting this yeah. because it's not perfect. So it's like you're taking what's, what we're taught to avoid right. and actually including it intentionally because then our eye sees it and we actually believe someone just is shooting this UFO going by. Right. Well, I, I'll give you a couple little things about lens flares and glows, which was part of what my learning curve when I was working on 2001 with Kubrick. Uh, Jeffrey Unsworth, who was the cinematographer on, on 2001, was an incredible cinematographer who'd grown up on black and white photography. Most of his movies right. were black and white. And when you're working in black and white, you really learn how to use light as a edges of light against dark or dark against light or, you know, you paint with light. 
And so he was a master at that. And so he was part of the team that built all the lighting into 2001. So we're doing the effects and we're doing the space stuff. And we started, and Kubrick wanted lens flares too. He wanted the sun to be so bright that it was like super vivid and burning out. So we ended up doing some tests and we say, well, you need to be about 30 stops overexposed to get a lens flare to happen. And so we had, you know, we had a little cutouts of the sun and we'd have a very bright 5K light on the animation stand burning up into the, <coughs> into the camera lens to get a lens flare. And then we started doing stuff with uh, Jupiter and planets, and he started asking for stuff that I thought was really intriguing and was new to me. He says, well, you know, that the sun is going to enter the shot from the left or the right or something, but it's not going to actually be in the shot yet, but you want to know it's coming. And so we would actually, you know, in the gate of the camera, there's, there's usually a little ribbed black edges to absorb any light that doesn't want to get to the film. We would go in there and tape um, tin foil to the inside of the camera gate so that if something was off camera it would actually reflect inside and get exposed onto the film even before it entered the frame. And that was on purpose. So you'd see these weird lens flares that would anticipate the illumination. And there's stuff in Close Encounters too. Like there's a shot where uh, you'll remember the shot is from behind the guy that's at the console that plays music. And the mothership is up there, but the mothership's not really up there. <coughs> And they shot a live action shot, kind of a, a, a tilt down or a tilt up camera, which it was. But we wanted to sell the idea that there was a really bright big mothership up out of frame. So we just shot a bunch of lights with this tinfoil thing out of frame and burned it into the shot as though the mothership was out of frame. And it works really great. And we actually moved on it so that the lens flares shifted during the tilt down. And there's a bunch of those shots in this movie. There's extra lens flares that we added with lights off camera just to sell the idea that there was some really brilliant, brilliantly illuminated thing Amazing. just out of frame. Amazing. Uh, Before we talk about the mothership model and the other miniatures, uh, Michael, could you tell us about some of the concept artists that Steve <coughs> engaged and what they did to actually try to illustrate some of these ideas about what things would look like in this movie? Well, there, there was um, the main uh, artist, uh, starting from the beginning, was... George? Mabari? No. Mabari? Oh, my God. George Jensen? George, George Jensen. George Jensen. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and, and George basically read the script, and he talked to Stephen, and he came up with these works of art that... And not only, as many production artists do, they'll do black and white sketches and, you know, hand them over. George did paintings. He did full-on paintings that really right. helped Stephen in, in terms of the, of the way he plotted the shot. And, and I would imagine helped you guys Absolutely, yeah. in terms of the way it was shot and, and the effects. Um, they, they were absolutely brilliant works of art, and I'm thrilled that I have so many of them in the book. Uh, but but that was truly he he was the first guy there and he also worked with Joe Alves the production designer in all of the stuff of Devil's Tower um, and and then the you know Box Canyon the the landing site as it were um, and we have a lot of great stuff of scenes that unfortunately were not able to be done one of them being the cuboid sequence which was. Doug's lost cameo <laughs> in the movie. Um, but uh, if anybody uh, defined or could sell what Star Wars was originally going to look like, it was Ralph McQuarrie with his portfolio of amazing paintings. And then he came over to do this, the main mothership right. uh, concept painting. Is that correct? Right. Because that was, that was done in technically in post-production. Um, during the entire shoot, Steven still didn't know what his mothership was going to look like. Uh, he had some ideas. The first one was that you really didn't see the mothership very much. It, it came across the sky as a very dark object. Something blotting, so black it would blot out, out the stars. The skies, right? Right. So, and yeah. consequently, the principal photography stuff has shadows moving over people. Does it bother you when you see that? That it's this illuminated object of a mothership but we're no, seeing but shadows? No, but I think that's the magic of movies, that it's a, it, that you, you, it sells the idea 
of some big object looming into the shot. So that shadow actually works in the context of it actually being very bright at the same time. And, and I think and that's... We, we were consciously aware of that when we were shooting because I was also building <clears throat> these weird reflectors. I built this big like four by eight sheet of plywood with a million pieces of broken mirrors on it to try to reflect refract light onto Neary, to Richard Dreyfus and other actors in some of the shots where they're looking up. There's all kinds of light on their faces and colored gels and stuff. So we were simultaneously aware of it being bright and creating a shadow at the same time. It's like the shadow of the moon or something. That's the kind of license you can take in movies because it sells an idea. And I thought it was really beautiful. And Vilmo, you know, he and his guys did a great job. So was it uh, this Macquarie painting that we've seen a lot, that basically was the basis for now, now building this thing? Um, this the mothership model, and how would you decide? Greg is going to talk now. Yeah, <laughs> how would you decide? How would you decide like the scale, the size, and um, you, know, you know what to use? I frankly don't remember seeing many drawings of the mothership. Uh, I think there was something that Ralph did, but I remember I made a little maquette about this big, with, uh, out of wood with wire and spires on it, and that's sort of what everybody said. Okay, go ahead and do that. But there was no real blueprint drawing of anything. We just sort of went with that. So but that was the second mothership. The first mothership we built was that what four or five foot cone that was glossy black that was split down the middle. And we started that, and we never finished it. <laughs> well, could, uh, uh, Stephen had these illustrations that uh, um, what's his name, the illustrator, that George Jensen had done, and had painted this object that kind of looked like a kazoo. Kind of a weird old oblong thing with a circular gizmo on it. Looking exactly like a kazoo. Oh. I said, well, I don't think that's gonna sell. <laughs> and I think one of the funniest first stories was when I first came on the movie, before I got hired to come on the movie, they were already experimenting with UFOs and motherships on a stage using the old 1950s techniques that Dennis was just talking about. They had neon illuminated disc shaped objects on wires flying through smoke on a stage and that's exactly what it looked like you know, they kind of wobbly and, and it was really B movie crap that they were working on see that's and, why I had to get out of the business that's the <laughs> that's the best you could do with that stuff it's not any good yeah so that was when he Stephen realized well we got to go a complete major step beyond this or this movie is going to be not very good looking and we had to find a completely different way. And there was another period where um, he wanted to try to get his feet wet with the whole idea of computer-generated stuff. And uh, there was some experiments with Triple I, you know, uh, John Whitney Jr. and uh, Gary Demos, and who else was there? Remember? Yeah, I don't remember about this. Well, it was a. It was a. They actually they wanted to be able to track the camera and then add the mothership or visual effects using computer graphics. Mm -hmm at that time. Wow. And that was the objective and they'd been kind of sold this expectation that this was feasible and there were some very early tests that those guys, John Whitney Jr., Gary Demos, and one other man, I can't remember, uh, I'll probably get shot after this for not remembering, but they had done some tracking tests of actually shooting camera pans and tilts with markers in the frame and then these were going to be read by a computer to generate information to inform a computer-generated image how to be superimposed and track and match. And this was incredibly early on in that world, and it took forever. They were writing code for weeks trying to get this tracker to work because it was like a ballistic missile tracker and like a NASA kind of thing that they were trying to solve because I was based on this idea that they had talked, this triple I company was Information International Incorporated or something like that, that had a Cray computer. I mean, this was the first big supercomputer. The supercomputer was not busy at night. Everybody went home, so they made a deal to use the computer at night. That was, that was what they were doing. And so I said, well, make a lens flare. Well, they spent weeks trying to make a lens flare, which is actually not easy to do to write code to build something to raise rays of light and atmosphere and everything. And it just went on and on and on and on. And we all realized that we were giving them a shot at it, but that they were failing. And it was just too early in the world of CGI to be able to do it or pull it off or make or deliver anything on time. 
was similar to the problems that hit Star Trek the motion picture a little bit later. So we just said, well, we're going to have to go back to motion control and physical objects and models and pound it out. That was but it was very visionary at the time. That was the first time I've heard them connected with Close Encounters work. I mean, we knew about their X-Wing test, which is what we brought to you when we talked to you at ILM. Um, in 79, I think they did that. And that, you know, to actually glimpse the future, you know, couldn't do it yet, but it's like there was definitely something something there to what those guys were onto. Yeah. That's a whole other subject that we can get to. But in terms of building this mothership, I mean, again, how would you decide on the scale? How would you decide how to light the interior? Um, and make it self self lighting. Um, and again, it, we've heard stories about I think on two thousand one as well as Star Wars about raiding model kits for to yeah. actually uh, create these things. So I mean, really, how do you go about building this mothership? Uh, my lighting. Uh, my approach for the whole sense of scale deal is I didn't want to use any model kits that could be recognized per se. Uh, if you want to see how big the mothership was. I've got two pieces out there that are part of the Manhattan ring that we did a quarter detailed section, then molded those, and then made a complete ship out of them. Uh, we had different terms for the different levels of lighting. We named them like uh, the Bronx, Manhattan, uh, Coney Island, Harlem, etc. So we can code out like, well, light up this section now, light up that section now. The main detailed pieces are from model railroad kits. They're basically model railroad uh, ties that hook the tracks together. We used a lot of those. Uh, I handled the, I sort of approached the model like a Surratt painting. I didn't want any flat surfaces that would give a fake sheen. Any areas that were flat, we took some modeling paste and stippled it on there so it wouldn't give any reflection. It would just like be very diffractive. Uh, some of the other crazy parts we use, like I'm sure you know about, the mailbox and the Volkswagen bus and the TIE fighter and the R2-D2 and the cemetery. Just some other things just to break up the scale and just make your eye go like, what the hell did I just see? Is that a shark? Oh, OK. Have you all seen Star Wars uh, by that time, by the time but when you stuck R2-D2 on it? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, R2-D2 was not my idea. It was done by one of the model guys, Dave Jones, who had just gotten off of Star Wars, and he had put it in the background. And I think Doug saw it and said, well, that's a good idea. Let's put it up front. <laughs> <laughs> and so I made another one with a fiber optic in it so it would light up, and we stuck that in front. If you don't know, it's like in the very first shot of the mothership as it comes up behind Melinda Dillon looking up at it, it the mothership rises up and basically glued upside down is R2-D2. Well, I think it, it deserves mention that um, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas and Francis Ford Coppola and a number of other, and, and uh, several other directors were all buddies at that time. They were all Obama, young John Milius, USA whole, Film yeah, School yeah. people, and they were coming up together, and they were collaborating with one another and showing each other dailies and trying to one-up each other, and it was really charming. And so the idea of s sticking stuff on the mothership that reflected Star Wars and then other stuff that's in there that reflects Empire of the Sun that was not yet in production. That's 1941. Uh, 1941, excuse me. 1941. So there was like airplanes, you know, World War II airplanes on the mothership, right? Which also kind of yeah. evoked the opening scene well, of the that movie. Was, yeah, really. it was basically the opening scene. I said, well, let's put the Avenger model right where they find those yeah. that lost squadron. Yeah, and there's a matte painting where you're, you're, the camera's up kind of high and you're looking at the rim of the mothership. It's right at the very top of the frame. It's actually the names of all the people in the mat department painted on the <laughs> outside of the mothership. So it was just kind of inside jokes that you could get away with because no one would know unless you knew what to look for. Yeah, and the, the visual weird. cues we get with the design of the mothership are very interesting in that we have almost a traditional saucer shape on one side, projected grid that almost resembles what I think what Stephen said, if you stood on your head on Mulholland Drive and looked at the valley at night. Right. The other side is what looks like a skyscrapers of a giant city. And of course, it comes over one way and does a flip. Yep. Um, and that's very interesting because it kind of gives us, it was the idea to give us some sense of the scale. Yeah, absolutely. That was a, a trick to just say, well, that's a city at night like Manhattan, which is what Greg's talking about. 
that would kind of set the scale. Because if you think, well, that must be 10 square miles, yeah. I mean, this happens in your mind. You just yeah, and then there's the, the other, the real most fundamental trick, which was to put the mothership behind Devil's Tower. That instantly set the scale. If it was in front of Devil's Tower, it could have been three feet, three feet from the camera or 300 feet from the camera or whatever, but by being behind a mountain, that means it's big. Right. And the added kind of oddness, which we don't think much about, of this ingenious idea of having it come up rather than descend, come up almost out of the ground yeah. in a way. Yeah. Very, very interesting. But uh, we, you know, we have, you know, this all kind of reaches this unbelievably iconic shot of the mothership behind the mountain, which we have the mothership, we have the mountain, we have uh, the live action of the base of operations, very small. You have <coughs> stars in the sky in the background. So in that moment, the Devil's Tower is also a scale model and landscape, and you built all of those landscapes as well as for the early part of the film when the initial UFO encounters happened. So what goes into building these miniature landscapes and the, and the mountains specifically? Uh, a lot of eye strain for one point. Uh, like with the toll booth, we had to uh, sight that and build it by looking through the camera lens. We had a frame of the actual shot, and then we had a guy out there like, well, move it down a little farther, mark that area off in space, and we just sort of built it that way. That was one of the trickiest shots we made for the uh, saucers going through the toll booth. And as far as the landscapes go, we actually managed to sneak two perspectives into the Crescendo Summit uh, that was all designed by Dan Gose, one of the illustrators. And um, I think one of the first things we, we did was the intersection where Neary sears the, the train light thing go crazy. And we took a Polaroid, I think we sent it to you in Mobile, and you said, where's that location? That looks pretty good. And so we said, well, that's done in your shop, Doug. <laughs> So yeah, Greg did some amazing stuff based on you know site location scout photographs of the area that we were shooting. The movie right, we saw some in great stuff. Mobile, Alabama suburbs. We saw some great stuff the other night that illustrated how you had um, the Crescendo Summit set, which was built on the same dirigible hangar as the next door. Next door, door okay. Married with the backgrounds of your miniatures, and then adding to that the UFOs that pass by with interactive lighting and stars in the sky, which it, fa it was fascinating to hear you say that don't show your stars out of focus. But again, those are shots there where again, it's like you, for the first time I think in a movie, we actually believe the night sky. So I mean, it was a bunch of elements had to be put together just for that one seemingly simple quick moment. Well, that was, you know... And also miniature roadway shots. That's where you, right? hit, so. you hit the wall with some really tricky and difficult compositing issues because the tradition in movies, if you're going to superimpose actors on a foreground set piece into some background, you'd use blue screen, right? And blue screen just looked cut out. It was, I, I never liked blue screen. And it was very troublesome and certainly wouldn't have worked very well for a scene like that. So. I suggested to Stephen that we use front projection, which was what we had used on 2001 for the Dawn of Man sequence, which is you're, you're projecting an image onto a giant screen that's way out behind the set, but the, the light is being reflected back into the lens, and it looks like it's really there. I used it extensively on Silent Running as well. Because anything in the foreground is sitting in its own shadow, right? So you right, so it just exactly know. fits its own shadow. It's a really clever optical arrangement of a 45 degree mirror and the camera's looking through the mirror at the projected image that's coming through the mirror, and they're all perfectly lined up. So the image that's coming out of the camera and by the projector is actually hitting a 100-foot wide screen way across the hangar and then coming back into the lens. And so it makes Melinda Dillon and Carrie Guffey and everybody seem like they're actually in front of it, and it's actually out so there. It's the screen actually creates the brightness then. Yeah. It's so this therefore, what hits the people is not, it's too dim to register. But right. It, right. So right. So the screen yeah. is magnifying the brightness by about 200 times because of these little beads of glass that are just bouncing light, rays of light back at the source. So the light is actually shining on the set and on the people, but it's so below the, the threshold of sensitivity of the film, you don't see it. It just doesn't record. Yeah, that in 2001 that's a, is still... Front projection is a great technique. Yeah, still, still to this day, 2001 this looks amazing, you know. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, 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 there's still places where I would use front projection in certain circumstances. So you have this mothership model built. Now you have to shoot this. And again, to come back to the atmospheric depth and this use of a smoke room, 
And um, I'm, Greg's been around, you, we mentioned 1941 before. I don't think there's a shot in that movie, miniature unit or, or main unit that doesn't have smoke in it. But uh, that, was, that was key, wasn't it? To actually making this thing exist in physical space on film was the creation of the smoke room. So take me through the shooting process for these shots. And was it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was it just a, um, was it a prescri- you had a, like a list of shots to accomplish? Or was, or was something experimented with and then just maybe uh, worked with editorially later? I think a little bit there was uh, some experimenting for exposure and the smoke density and stuff like that. They were all sort of shot as separate passes. And I wasn't involved in any of the design, but I, so I was working with Doug and Richard really to give them what they needed. And they could say, okay, here's the one we like. And then uh, it would be a matter of then shooting the shot. But the shots were all predetermined. I mean, we knew exactly what the cut was going to be. And, and there were essentially two sets. There was the un- underbelly where you saw that, then there's the wide view when you see the top and the whole underbelly. And they were shot. Each one took about like two and a half months to shoot, each one of those two. And then they were intercut. But that's, uh, and that was kind of it. And I had no idea when I came onto what it was going to be. I just heard it's like four or five months work and it ends up being the mothership, you know, the end of the movie. And, uh, but the reason the smoke for, especially for the, the wide shots, when you see the whole model of it, uh, we had to breathe, the, no matter how we tried, we had to breathe the smoke that was in the air for like oh. months. And I think I came down with pneumonia. I don't remember if that was when that happened or something like that. What would you use to make this smoke? I think it was just regular mold smoke with a mold smoke. Is that right? Oil smoke? Right. I think it was regular mold smoke. I mean, we, everybody was so tired of it by the time we finished this movie that they didn't want to ever do it again. And so when, when Star Trek came up and Apogee was working on Star Trek, the motion picture, because we subbed out some of the work, they said, we just can't bear the smoke. So they tried to figure out how to do smoke with water, vaporized water or steam, which turned out to be so volatile and un unable to control because of atmospheric pressure and temperature, they had to give up. And then they switched over to, uh, instead of mold smoke, it was uh, mineral oil, it was baby oil. Mm. They thought, well, it's good for babies, it's okay for us. <laughs> well, it's actually not really, but. Oops. But you know, I, it was me, Scott Squires, and at night, Hoyt Yakeman shooting this stuff. And we had a room that was, you know, a quarter of this size or much smaller than that, a fifth, an eighth the size. And then we could look out of to see where the smoke area was and the model and everything. But so it was supposed to be, cl- you know, free of smoke in there. It still got in there, and we were coughing up smoke for months afterwards after the show was over. And it was just in your lungs, in your lungs, you know. And I kept thinking, oh, it's gonna kill me, but but it'll be a long time before I'll be 40 before that happens or something. <laughs> <laughs> now, were those, it may have been very, you know, it may have been good for us. I mean, we don't know. Were these shots um, done? Um, with multiple passes, so the computer camera, the computer. Yeah, but not double exposures. Everything was separate pieces of film. There were some, a few, very few, that were actually rewound and shot again for some of the stuff that needed it, that we could composite, but a lot of them, the mats were shot separate, and sometimes we'd split the focus a little bit so we could and double expose them on top of themselves because it was taking too long to do it at F-16 or something like that. That didn't happen very often, though. But it was, a, it was basically elements going so that they could uh, figure out what they wanted. But we would do, you know, sometimes we do three, four exposures on, uh, of the lit ship or on the underbelly as w- one pass, and then that would just be one element then. But then we do a separate map pass, and maybe we had another one that was also used for something else. I don't know what. So how, about, I think that's right, Doug, right? Something like that? Yeah, I mean... It's been uh, a long time. The, the mothership was actually simpler than most of the UFOs. The UFOs were some shot in smoke and some shot not in smoke and some with neon and some with beams of light and LEDs and not LEDs but um, fiber optics and so some of them were seven passes that had to be exactly matched. Are you putting this on the same film each time? On the same film so seven passes onto the same piece of film and that's where the computer control yeah, comes in because the computer has to exactly right. you match. Bringing your film back you gotta, and do it again. Film yes. back. Everything has to come back to the same starting point and shoot all those frames again with that same move and if you make a mistake or don't calibrate it right. All 65 millimeter. 65 millimeter, right. you're, you're, you have to shoot it again. So that's where you get guys like Dave Stewart who was mentally so focused he would get it right and you could really count on the passes matching up. 
would you would this all happen generally in the same day, or would it be you'd be no, looking, you'd looking be, at uh, one pass on the same day? No, you wouldn't. So ever next split. day you'd see the daily of that pass, and the next day of that the next pass. No, or, you would or, get all the passes in one day. Okay. Yeah, I don't remember any time that we would actually ever shut the machine down and come back and shoot more passes on another day. I, I'm not aware of that. And we worked 24 hours. Right. You know, with with two crews, so or three crews. If we had to. You had to because anything could happen. The room could settle. The temperature could change if you wait, waited, you know, eight hours difference. Stuff guaranteed would not line up. Absolutely guaranteed. Wow. Any earthquakes? I don't remember. Yeah. During that, there, there, was, there, was, there, was, there was an earthquake, yeah. but it, uh, they, they squeezed by. Yeah, and it, yeah and we had an earthquake during effect. silent running as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. But I, I, I'd like to make one point, though, because yeah. as, as we're talking about this and, and we're using the term computer, it's not a computer like we have today. It no. wasn't. It was a box. It, it had counters in it, digital counters. They had to do the calculations. They had to run and count the pulses that it took to get from one point to the other or to rotate everything. So it, it wasn't like you sit down at your keyboard and go, execute, right. and it did it. It was so much more complicated, which, yeah. which is the, you know, and, and the point ultimately that you have to make about this whole movie is that these people did this entire movie with a crew of about 40 people. And they, the effects more than still hold up today, and it's the same effects that it takes 800 people when you see, uh, you know, a, a movie today, to do, so we're all just sitting in cubicles. Right. Whereas these computers were also actually sending commands to very big, yes. you know, equipment with gears moving around. And uh, but tell me if so, when this shot came back, what was it like? Because of course it wasn't just render and okay, I'll go have a cup of coffee and it'll be rendered and I'll see it. You had to actually probably wait for it to come back from the lab and, the and dailies, see what you got. Yeah, like, oh, it was dailies in the morning, you know, and then sometimes Stephen would come in late with his cowboy boots on and you hear these boots walking in on the concrete floor oh Stephen's coming Stephen's coming and uh, you know it, it, it's just like anything else you get dailies at 8 or 9 in the morning we had an amazing thing happen though near the end we had a lab run that went out at, to MGM at like 4 or 4.30 and we had 8 a.m. dailies and I thought my god they processed it and made a print in like four hours how come we don't do that all the time? And I thought that, I was thinking, to, I talked to George a couple of times up north, let's set up a lab that just runs all the so time. Right so it's right there. Th you know, four hour dailies it would be amazing, hmm. but never happened. Well, we actually did that on the Back to the Future ride. Oh, you did? Oh, good. Yeah, we set up a lab right at my studio. Excellent. And um, we could get dailies back in two hours. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> missed the Back to the Future ride? How come ride? nobody picked up on it? Love that ride. In IMAX. <laughs> but so uh, the live action element of the landing strip, okay, you probably all know. Mobile, Alabama, they couldn't find a soundstage large enough with no center support, so they ha it's actually a blimp, a giant blimp hangar. No, no it was actually an aircraft. It was an airplane oh, hangar. Yeah. Oh, was it? Okay. The, it was the, the story is it gets a little confusing because okay. we looked at a blimp hangar in Tillamook, oh, okay. Oregon. Oh, okay. We could have shot this movie in Tillamook, Oregon. There was a beautiful blimp hanger. You'll see it occasionally in television commercials. They do car commercials in there reg regularly. It's this big uh, elliptical wooden structure. It's really quite beautiful. It was made, you know, for World War II. And uh, so it was a blimp hanger. It was just enormously big. Wow. But uh, we, we, it was a regular airplane hanger. The hangers identical side by side right, the right. at the Air Force Base that had been closed down. So how would you get the shot of the entire thing that then becomes just a, a tiny little component of this mothership arrival shot. Well, we had to. What's that process of integrating the miniature with that and the ship? Well, there was one, the, 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 the base. I don't know if you're going to see any pictures of it. It's kind of a U shaped set. There's George on the set. set. Yeah. And then it faced, it faced as though it faced out onto an open plane kind of thing. And so on the live action set, Joe Alves actually built this giant tent that went outside beyond the hangar doors. So there was some dirt and some landing lights and stuff that actually went out for a while. That ended up blowing away in a big kind of tornado. Uh, but then to do the reverse, I, I just went out there to the end of that set and shot back into the set to get that plate. So 
was just a lock off shot, pretty pretty simple to do. You were cheating perspective because we couldn't get to be, you know, a mile away. We just had to shoot it with a wide angle lens and kind of hope you didn't notice. We didn't notice. <laughs> so um, now it, it just it still looks great to this day, and that, that's what's amazing about this movie is that you actually still totally buy it. And I know that um, you have been constantly pushing us to get things more believable, more spectacular. You've devoted your life to this. Um, and Dennis, you were on the front lines of this transition to uh, computer graphics. And I still think that uh, the original Jurassic Park, the CG work in that, still holds up magnificently. Um, and um, is, in spite of how much has been done since, but you know, there's only six and a half minutes of CG in that film. We have Stan Winston's full motion dinosaurs and all of that. But um, what we're hearing about with Close Encounters is everything is in front of a camera and you're telling a story in which things have to believably be in physical space. And that's a limitation um, that you spoke of Doug Friday night at the event that Gene hosted, where um, you, you're adding the blur later and, thing, and, and, and things like that. Um, and you want to try, and, and we're starting to see a movement back towards physically building miniatures and, um, and actually putting things that are physical in front of a camera because they exist in real physical space, which things in a computer do not. So uh, what is the pathway to use the CG technology that we have, but still get back to this believability? Well, I think it's a, a lot of stuff. I think, uh, I actually think that computers can pretty much do the work. The problem is it's been broken up into pieces and people are broken up into specialists and there's no, and you don't have any opportunity to look at the thing in front of you and tweak this and tweak that and move over here and raise that up and paint that over there. You don't have any chance to do it. And it's too bad because it, it when all the pieces come together and it looks like the storyboard, someone calls it a final. So that's the end of it, and it goes out. And, if that, and the storyboard guys are working, worked on four other films that year that are the, doing the same stuff. So I don't think there's any, ch it's very hard to put anything new in it. It's got to start with the director. And then he's got to have it clear in his mind that he wants something and find a team that's, gonna, that's going to be up for doing it and willing to take the risk. Um, but I, you know, I think you can do it. I think what's... I think the computers can do it. The problem is not that. The problem is the way is they're not putting, in, we're not putting enough into it. We're not getting enough backlight. We're not getting enough glare off the surfaces. The textures are, don't, aren't reflecting correct. They're, they're stopping too soon. It's not a matter of detail, though. It's a matter of just of a, of a complexity that when you look at it, you aren't even aware it's complex, but it's all around us here right now. And and right, you know, half the people, half of what I see in here right now, I can't find the edges of something. Right. You know, your hair in front of it. In computer image, you'll see the edge of everything. You'll see your edge, you'll be a little sharper, not, not just sharper, that something's off between that and in front of her hair. So everything just looks, or not everything, but a lot of it looks funny. Well, there may be like a randomness to it. You were talking about the cloud yeah. tank and that how too. you know happy accidents happen, things that you don't plan because it's subject, it's, in, it's affected by its environment. But in a computer, it's not affected by its environment. So, um, tell me about your 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 sort of mission to get uh, get that back into film. Well, it's not that I want to get it back. It's just that uh, I, I, I'm a big take us further. I'm really glad we got rid of optical printers. Digital digital compositing is really cool, and the fact that we can put images together and we don't have any matte lines anymore, and we can smoosh it and Photoshop it and do all this stuff to make pretty seamless composites is really fabulous. So I'm not trying to go back to the good old days, but in the context of a really good miniature like the mothership or like the space station in 2001, these are really beautifully, elegantly made miniatures that are photorealistic for all intents and purposes. And if they're light, if they're lit and photographed properly, they can look like exactly what you want. And so you can look at those shots 50 years later and they still are convincing. Whereas computer graphics is often as good as the algorithm of the month or the shader of the month or the whatever the next new 
uh, improvement is, which is going on continuously in, in the world of, of CGI, and it's getting better and better all the time, which is always good. But, but well, I'm going to let Dennis, he's, he's in this world, I'm not in this world at all, of, of obsolescence, where you can say something that looks really good, but three years later, uh, it's not as good as what's current. So there's a, pardon? Blade Runner, yes. What about Blade Runner? Oh yeah, well I'm not going to be derogatory in any way. <laughs> but that's set just two years from, the first Blade Runner set just two years from now in Los Angeles. And uh, <laughs> we, in certain parts of town it's starting to look like that. <laughs> <laughs> All shot location. So uh, we've, it's two fifteen. How is everybody feeling? How's everybody doing for time? Whatever you want. How are all? You, how are you all feeling? Good. Do you have questions, or should we go on to maybe talk about the ETs a little bit? I mean, you guys didn't really work on that, but maybe since they're since that's what the Close Encounters all leads to. Do uh, Michael? Do you want to tell us a little about uh, accomplishing the ETs for this film? Well, they they set out to do it a number of ways. Um, the the, the basic ET was um, someone in a leotard, a, a little girl in a leotard. Um, for the hands, they had tried making articulated fingers, gloves, but those became very cost prohibitive. Um, and you know, a lot of the a lot of the problems they faced were in terms of costs. And the budget was constantly rising, and Columbia Pictures was fighting against that budget rising. So there, there were molds produced for the heads. They were basically wearing a head, some gloves, and the leotards. And another reason why they are in fog or smoke was because, and, and this is something that, that Stephen is a master of, is obfuscation of not being able to see every little detail that's going on and to hide. and, and to create more suspense. Also, it makes you, make you kind of want to squint. Almost. Right. You did it with E.T. also in, there you e, go. in E.T., right? So this backlit, you know, um, have to squint to see the detail. Very, very clever. And there were, so most of the, the film in, in Alabama was shot that way. But there were also problems that arose because the climactic scene where Francois Truffaut meets the alien and they do the hand gestures, the rubber gloves weren't cutting it. it you could see the seams, you could see it, it just wasn't going to work. So in post-production, Stephen had two new aliens created because he, and he didn't want them to look the same because he wanted to show there was a diversity in that society. So he called upon a gentleman named Bob Baker who was a master puppeteer to create the first alien that yeah, comes spindly, out of the spider ship, like the alien. Right, um, which was influenced by um, uh, Stephen's love of, of the artist, sculptor, um, I'm, I'm thinking Ian Ellie, but Giacomini. that's it. Giacomini, thank you very much. Um, and they, they filmed that, but then because he wanted for that final scene with Lacombe, something even more special, he called Carlo Rambaldi, who had won Academy Awards and had not long earlier done all of the articulated um, facial and, and things for King Kong. Right, and the giant hand. The giant yeah. hands and all that. So Rambaldi worked very loosely based on what had started as, as the, they were called the, the greys, um, all of the major extras, um, but he made some modifications and, and it became a fully articulated puppet. Um, if you, I believe there's a picture in the book that shows him standing in the middle of a sound stage and there's wires and everything right. leading into a huge console where people are pulling levers and pushing buttons to... And in a way this was like a proto E.T. Exactly. Later, well, they, uh, Stephen referred to this alien as Puck, right. which he later dubbed E.T. as well. Right. So, and Rambaldi was the one who created E.T. later on. Right. So, um, 
and and when he smiles, that was Stephen was operating the lever uh, to get that smile. Wow. So it, it was a combination of a lot of different efforts, and you know. And you the, mentioned the hand signs, and one of the things I love about this movie is the amazing idea of using music as the form of communication. It's the universal language, so if you show music to anybody on the planet, if they read music, they know what that says. Why nobody thought to apply this to you know, extraterrestrials until now was incredible. But then you have to visually represent it, and Joe Alves came up with this idea of the colored light board and to take uh, the, the color coding of fifths and ideas like that, and then the hand signs. And am I correct? Stuff that that was something that you presented, that the hand sign that could... Yeah, could just, just completely inadvertently through another friend of mine, I became aware of a thing called the Kodai, spelled K-O-D-A-L-I, method of teaching deaf people music. And so they developed this whole hand sign thing, which is really quite beautiful. And I, and I introduced the idea to Stephen to use in the movie, and then brought he shipped my friend down to the location to teach it to Francois and use it under his direction as a way of being an accurate depiction of hand signs that represent musical tones. It was, I thought it was really quite beautiful. Yeah, it, it worked, and what's great is that nobody's excluded from the movie, because if you, if you or say you're a deaf person, you will understand the hand signs, the colors, right. and the lights. Right. If you're a blind person, you, the music and the sound, you know, includes you also. So I mean, there's this, this sort of message of inclusivity, um, and that sort of everybody, you know, because Roy, the Roy Neary character is just a very everyman, basic guy from the Midwest. So there's just this wonderful theme of inclusivity uh, about about the project that all just gel just as a result of everybody's uh, talent. Yeah, I thought the idea of, of a, a kind of a an intercosmic method of communication via music was a beautiful idea. I don't know if that originated with Stephen or someone else, but it was a really interesting example of the kind of collaborative planning you have to do in a movie, because Stephen's working with John Williams, who's going to do the score, but he will do the score in post-production after the movie's right. cut. Although they had to come up but with the five tones. they had to tones, come up with the right. five tones, and therefore John Williams has to really figure out what the entire music cue is going to be like at the end of the movie which was based obliquely on When You Wish Upon a Star from Disney, which they had licensed from Disney. There's another version of the movie that was tested in a preview of actually When You Wish Upon a Star at the end of the movie. The actual song from Pinocchio. The actual yeah. song yeah. from yeah. the yeah. Disney, uh, yeah. Pinocchio, what, what, what yeah. movie was, When You Wish, well, whatever. Yeah, the Jiminy Jimmy Cricket. Cricket. Yeah. Yeah. And they actually tested that with the audience. I was part of that. We were in Denver Dal or something. Dallas. 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 The Medallion yeah. Theater in Dallas. And we, we set up infrared cameras in the theater, non, unbeknownst to the audience, and we filmed the audience during the screenings. I don't know if anybody's ever told this story, because it's probably a violation of privacy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he, Stephen wanted to know if this was going to be, if this was going to work or not, because there was kind of a, a too cute potential of doing that, which turned out to be too cute, and so that was thrown out. But if you think of When You Wish Upon the Star, you'll hear it in the score, even though it's not that specifically. It's just a few notes off that. And, it was and trying you to get to that. you hear it on a music box that's in Roy Neary's workshop. You hear a few notes from Right, him. he's got the Jiminy Cricket music box right. Right, so playing it, so set, setting itself up, and they have a conversation about going to see Pinocchio, you know, yeah. so. And, and one of the things that Stephen said about the, um, the reaction of the audience to the screening where they used Wish Upon a Star um, was he felt that by having that song where it was at the very end gave some people the idea that the whole movie had before had been a fantasy right. and, and that was another reason why he decided to, to cut it out. Right. He's um, also cited that, uh, well uh, to get back to the music, one, one more point about the music which I, I don't know comes up, I came up with it when I was researching it and just recently wrote about it, is that Stephen's mother was a classical pianist. Yes. And his father was a pioneering computer technician. And if you look at Close Encounters and what has to come together to actually make this communication with the ETs happen, it's 
combination of music and, and computer technology. So whether he was, he, he claimed that he was completely unaware of this connection, but it was almost like a merging of both of his parents. Uh, it's a very, very, very personal right. film. You know, despite the epic scope and all the effects, it still has this you know, incredibly personal aspect to it. That, that, and that's kind of what makes it be pulled up, why we all still watch it and care about it and are affected by it. Yeah. Why Stephen is Stephen. Right. Because a lot of these ideas, the hand gestures and everything, make, you know, how many directors would have just rejected that? Oh, that's a cute idea for something else, Doug. Sorry, goodbye. You know, but Stephen sees it as, a, oh my God, you know, it's personal. I can relate to it. People can relate to it. You know, that's the that's what the genius of a great director. And there are a few great directors that will take ideas from everywhere and use them. And you've been on and, and many, many shows with him, and you've seen that. Yeah, for, every for me, movie has not something. just him at all. There's a few guys around there that just are open to it, and they see it as part of a whole, and they they don't want to repeat the same thing. They want to add something to it. And Stephen was really into that, and George yeah. was into it, and you know, Cameron's into it. Everybody's into it. You know, the top guys. And, and music is really powerful. Anybody who makes a movie finds out that the, the music makes the difference, right. as George found out on Star Wars. I mean, that could have been terrible if, that, if John Williams hadn't done that score the way he did. It could have been really bad. And you know, there again, and the, movie, the, the music same year, made it. for the same composer. And the, yeah. not those two scores are nothing alike. Star Wars and Close Encounters are nothing alike. Both influenced by 2001, certainly. But... Um, Neither one feeling like we'd ever seen anything like it before. Right. And about Jaws, what would that have been like without that sound, without the music? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, it's it's a, it was a long tradition of music often being played on the set of silent movies. Right. It's really, it's very emotionally evocative, and, and good, good directors recognize that and use it. Right. Kubrick, Kubrick played music right. during the centrifuge shooting. Right, and we always heard him at blasting that. music during full yeah, metal Yeah, whenever jacket. there was no dialogue, we would play music. He would play music yeah. to get the mood. Well, St uh, Spielberg has always said 2001 was a big influence on this picture, and that, some of that comes out in the, in the music, too, with the way John took some of this avant-garde sound of what Kubrick chose existing concert hall music to represent, right. the, you know, the monolith and all of that, Billy Getty and that kind of sound. Um, the ETs always seem to bear a slight resemblance to the Star Child at the end of 2001 as well. Were you aware of any of this connection? And, um, and of course, the fact that you were on both of those, you know, um, we, we sensed some kind of continuity there. I, think, I, I actually think the continuity is inadvertent. <coughs> and I think that it has to do, going back to lens flares and, and blown out exposures to kind of hide the artifice of it all, that the Star Child was way overlit and way over gauzed in order to make it so indistinct that you couldn't be annoyed by the fact that it was a plaster model. And, and it was the same for, the, for these, these little girls with these big heads. They backlit it and smoked it up so much that you couldn't see that it was a, a bunch of little girls. It would just be more magical because you're hiding behind light. You're using light as a way to mask and create it, this diaphanous, mysterious kind of you know, spiritual almost thing. So I think that's where the similarity really lies. I don't think it was copying one or the other. And you were there all the way through principal photography down with <coughs> Alabama, right? So you saw all these attempts to put them on wires and fly yeah. them around and had the ETs running around playing with tr the equipment and part of the cuboid sequence. Yeah, there's just certain things more. that it's just look crappy and it, you can right? cut them out. Right. They just don't work. The cuboids didn't work and the, the wire rigs didn't work. But there's also realities of shooting Wire rigging is really hard. It takes a lot of time, slows everything down. And there was supposed to be this kind of anti-gravitational levitation thing happening where people would walk out of the sh ship or, or people standing near the ship would just start floating uh, with anti-gravity. And right. it's just and very hard to create non-gravity when you have gonna gravity. It take another week. Well, but there was, there was one element that was added to that. It wasn't just about the girls being flown on wires. The technicians who were on the ground, they brought in a group of mimes. And they wanted the mimes to move super slowly as the girls were walking around, uh, floating around, so that when they cranked it, it would look like the technicians were walking normally and that the girls were floating, you know, it, it, a little more quickly. Um, so they, they tried that, but the mimes just couldn't quite cut it. And when they saw the 
finished shot, it just wasn't convincing enough, and that's when Stephen cut the shot, and and that there was no longer an anti anti gravity field in front of the mothership. Right. So he's got this a lot of ideas, but at the end of the day, when it's cut down to where it is, we now believe this is the moment of humans' contact with extraterrestrials, and sometimes the simplest answer is is the best. Yeah, sometimes less is more. There was a shot that we tried of a. I don't know if you heard about this, of an alien inside uh, the house. Yes, the farmhouse. Oh, we had an alien point? coming oh. down the stairway. Oh, and no, I just heard this. no, we just we couldn't make it work. We all just forgot about it, and moved on. Mm -hmm. uh, it just wasn't convincing because there was no way to because of the nature of the stairway. You couldn't backlight it. You couldn't make the glow. You couldn't get the smoke. It didn't make any sense, and so we just moved on. And said, well, sounds like something out of Poltergeist, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, so I was also going to say you don't have any zero G girls flying around the mothership, but you do have these ghosts flying around the Lost Ark at the end. Oh, right. They didn't need to be flying; they could have walked out, right? <laughs> I wonder. You know. Well, they had a problem with the uh, marionette too, because uh, the guys saw the overheads and this giant stick figure was coming up, and he was bouncing around like a Thunderbird's puppet. <laughs> and so, so I got on the bottom of it and grabbed his feet. So the camera panned down a little farther. I'm not on the ground, just hugging him like this, <laughs> bouncing like that. Well, I think at the end of the day, I mean, all of the work that ended up in Close Encounter is just is, is, is absolutely perfect. Still holds up. It comes from a period of time where this amazing cinema was just sort of bursting onto the public of things we had never seen before with these, you know, uh, indelible movies that we still look at today and don't see any reason to change it at all. Um, and they still affect us profoundly at an, at an emotional level also. And you guys were there to invent it. So. I, I, I would like to just say one final thing. Which Absolutely. Is I haven't seen The Restoration. I imagine may, many of you have. Yes. It, it, well, it, I haven't it seen it yet tremendous. because I've just been too busy to right. go see it. And I'm, I hope they got rid of our mat lines. They did. Yeah. They did get some mat lines okay, gone. Great. Yes. They did, I, I think I they did. Better, yeah, right. I think they did a superb job with the uh, with the restoration. It looked really, really. Well, good. I think it's a it's a horrible time in in movie history that when they do a restoration, they don't call me. I did not know that. You know, and the, I mean, the, the, I was. The, the, there's this I'm whole surprised. isolation. Yeah. They didn't want to forget about the guys who actually did the work. You know, play like if I had say, I, you would have been my first call. You would think so. I, you that's know. really weird. That's unfortunate. But, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll like do it that. again. Maybe we'll do it again. <laughs> That'd be nice, you know. So. But anyway, guys, do, do you have, do you, are you up for a couple of questions from the crowd here? Sure. Or should we wrap up? Any questions? Okay, yeah, we're here. Great. Did you think about working with water? The challenges are Asking Greg about working with water in, in miniatures. I, uh, I didn't deal with it that much. It was many of the effects guys like um, L.B. Abbott and uh, his crew and uh, A.D. Flowers. They tried to make it look, you know, into scale, which was really hard to do. But it was what it was. Uh, Dennis, um, was it during Star Wars that you had contacted Ken Ralston to come up to ILM? And, yeah, and, during and the how did you meet Ken, and what's a little more background in that story? Well, Ken and I, and Phil Tippett, and, and uh, John Berg, and Jim Danforth had all worked at Cascade, and a few others, on and off for, through the early 70s, and the occasional work that we could find. And uh, I knew Ken real well, and, and I, went, I broke away from that when they, they had financial trouble. I broke away and went over onto Star Wars to see if, to learn that stuff and convince Ken to come on to it as my assistant. And then we really had to like practically kidnap him to come up to ILM up north. He didn't want to make the move at all. And uh, but we managed to get him up there. And, and the rest is history. The rest, that's right, yeah. Right here. Okay. I read that they were doing a documentary on 2001 that kind of got cut off. Um, and I was wondering if that's going to be continuing because next year's the 50th anniversary. Uh, the question is about uh, the documentary on 2001 that I was working on several years ago with Warner Brothers, and uh, it's not ever going to happen, sadly. Um, I was working with a guy named Dave Larson, who was just, he, his entire life got 
consumed by researching 2001. And he knew more about it than I did. And he's been working on it for 20 or 30 years. It's quite an amazing archive of interviewing everybody who's ever worked on the movie, getting artifacts from the movie. And so he and I were going to collaborate on this making of 2001 documentary that would really go into it. And we had a whole list of about 50 people still alive who would do on-camera interviews. And we were going to do green screen to superimpose them into the sets that they built. And do, it was really a cool little project. But for some reason, Warner Brothers killed it. And just, we were in the final negotiations of actually signing a deal to do it, and they just stopped it for some reason. So we'll never know why it didn't happen, and they didn't want it to happen. And that gave me a very bad taste, because if you don't have the support of the studio, you can't make a documentary, because you can't get clips, you can't use this stuff. It's all copyrighted. So that's never going to happen. But the 50th anniversary is coming next year, and, and uh, another writer, uh, book guy, a friend of mine named Michael Benson, who does these beautiful big space books, decided to do a book about 2001, which is going to come out next year. And so I put him together with Dave Larson, who had all this archival stuff. And so a, a beautiful book on 2001 is going to come out, but it's not pictures, it's more talk and more interviews and insights into what was in the minds of those working on the movie. I think it'll be quite an extraordinary glimpse into 2001 and it'll come out next year. And then we're, I'm working with some other people on doing a, uh, a special 50th anniversary event at the Seattle Cinerama <coughs> Theater on 2001. Paul Allen owns that theater and has his own personal print of 2001. And so we're going we're gonna to make quite an event out of that. And I loved the one that you did at the Academy with Tom Hanks a few years back. Yeah. Yeah. That was great, that presentation. Was, Anybody, was that that? Yeah, that was, wasn't that great? So one more. I would just like to mention that Dave Hardworker is here. Oh, Dave is very, Dave. he's famous. He's, uh, I've, I've worked, with, worked with Dave on many movies, and he's a really one of the most reliable, special camera guys you're ever going to get your hands on. And he's alive and well. <laughs> well, uh, you guys were around visual effects artists all weekend in town for the VE Visual Effects Society Summit. Both of you were uh, Dennis and Doug entered into the Hall of Fame, duh. And um, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, Thank you. Ending your weekend with uh, the people who actually um, love your work, still go out to the movies, and still uh, love great art put on film. So uh, thank you all for coming. Of course, enjoy Michael's uh, wonderful book on Close Encounters of the Third Kind. We are not alone. <laughs>